Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Grand Rounds. Uh, we have a wonderful list of medical students who are going to present their uh, various projects, presentations. Our first one, uh, Anna Mueller, uh, she's from Florida International University. Um, and a fun fact about her is she's a black belt in karate. She also once took someone down with one finger. Um, I don't know if that's true. It probably is. Uh, the title of her project is Serious Serious Reynolds <laughs> Serious uh, Serious Reynolds Attachment in a patient with a port wine birthmark associated with prostaglandin analog therapy. Thank you so much. And so, yes, I'm Anna, and I'm going to present a case from the Pediatric Glaucoma Clinic at Bascom Palmer. I have no financial disclosures. So this is a case of an 11-year-old girl who presented for a glaucoma follow-up secondary to her uh, birth wine birthmark. She was diagnosed with a condition called phagomatosis pigmentovascularis. It's a rare condition that is characterized by Mongolian spots, which are blue discoloration of the skin, extensive dermal melanocytosis, and port wine birthmarks. Uh, she was diagnosed with glaucoma at the age of eight, and so far she has been on various drops, and all of them she has tolerated poorly with localized side effects. On that visit, her visual acuity was 20-20 bilaterally, and her IOP was elevated in her affected eye. Her fundus showed intact foveal reflex and glaucomatous cupping. So it was decided to change her to bimatoprost at that visit. She returned four months later. Her visual acuity was slightly reduced to 2030 in her affected eye, and her IOP remained ele elevated. So she was changed to Visalta, latanoprostin bunod, and four months later, she returned to clinic. Her visual acuity was still reduced to 2030 in her affected eye, and her IOP was still elevated. Visual fields and RNFL um, showed minimal progression from her baseline uh, two years ago. Her fundus showed this. So the white arrows outline serous retinal detachment that extend all the way to the phobia. And an OCT confirmed the diagnosis. So Vizalta was discontinued at this point, and two months later, her visual acuity was 2020, and the serous retinal detachment has significantly improved. So we did a literature review of all the cases of serous retinal detachment in port wine birthmark. And it turns out that there were 35 cases worldwide, it's a pretty um, rare condition. 33 of these cases were uh, of Sturge Weber syndrome patients, two were of phacomatosis pigmentovascularis, 100% of the cases had diffuse choroidal hemangioma, and 63% of the cases had glaucoma, which is probably secondary to the port wine birthmark. So how do all these conditions relate? It turns out that port wine birthmark, diffuse choroidal hemangioma, uh, phacomatosis pigmentovascularis and Sturge Weber syndrome all have uh, the same activating mutations in the GNAQ um, gene that essentially cause aberrant gene transcription and cellular proliferation. So we went back to these patients' uh, charts, earlier charts, and we found that she indeed had hyperopic, hyperopic shift on cycloplegic retinoscopy, which indicates choroidal expansion. And her ultrasound showed thickened ocular coat in her affected eye, which likely indicates diffuse choroidal hemangioma. So what is diffuse choroidal hemangioma? It's a congenital benign vascular tumor uh, characterized by tomato ketchup appearance on, of the fundus, thickening of the choroid and ill-defined borders. And it turns out that it is an independent risk factor for serous retinal detachment. And how so? So we put all the mechanisms into a cartoon. So I'm not sure if my, uh, yes, okay, perfect. So hemangioma is a vascular tumor and it has abnormal leaky vessels. And it has a mass effect that puts a lot of mechanical structure, me mechanical, um, stress on the retinal structure and function deforming it. Retinal vessels that are not shown in this cartoon that drain the retina to the choroid um, cannot drain it properly. And over time, the RPE uh, degenerates. And RPE is, of course, the part of the outer blood retinal barrier. But it also has an important function of pumping fluid from the retina to the choroid. And once the RPE degenerates, 
these pumps can no longer um, pump this fluid and fluid can accumulate in this space. So we went back to the 35 cases that we reviewed and uh, we asked whether there were on, uh, any preceding events to the serious retinal you know, detachment. And just to make it super clear, uh, any trigger events or preceding events do not imply causations, those are simply observation. So it turns out that most of the cases did not have any preceding events. 20% uh, of the cases occurred after surgery, particularly glaucoma surgery. 9% of the cases occurred during pregnancy where there is a significant hemodynamic shift. And 11% of the cases, so four, ca four cases in total, had to do with pharmacological agents. Three out of the four cases had to do with prostaglandin analogs, specifically prostaglandin F2-alpha. One case um, happened in a 26-year-old male who uh, took an arginine containing erectile dysfunction supplement and developed a serous retinal detachment right away. An arginine, once ingested, it is metabolized by nitric oxide, uh, nitric oxide synthesis to nitric oxide, which is a potent vasodilator. And interestingly, an interesting observation is that uh, Visalta is both prostaglandin F2 alpha and a nitric oxide um, donor. So, <laughs> We put together all the possible mechanisms by which a prostaglandin analog with or without nitric oxide may cause serious retinal detachment. And obviously those um, drugs are generally safe, but in an eye with a diffuse choroidal hemangioma, uh, they are more susceptible to the adverse effects of the medication. So prostaglandin analogs acts as, uh, um, it can stimulate pro-inflammatory mediators and in increase the disruption of blood retinal bar barrier. Um, it also stimulates the vascular endothelium and the RPE permeability, which increase the, um, how leaky those vessels and those cells become. Interestingly, prostaglandin analogs and nitric oxide can uh, induce angiogenesis via VEGF. And in a vascular tumor with torturous vessels, that's probably not a desirable outcome. Finally, nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator and it, and it can exacerbate exudation. And it leads to uh, fluid accumulation between the RPE and the neurosensory retina, and that's the definition for serious retinal detachment. This is the entire figure. And in conclusion, patients with port wine birthmarks are likely to have diffuse choroidal hemangioma and glaucoma. Diffuse choroidal hemangioma is an independent risk factor for serious retinal detachment. Some glaucoma drugs may increase the risk of serious retinal detachment, and therefore we recommend a regular surveillance for serious retinal detachments in, in these patients. And something that I personally learned working on this, on this case is that in medical school, when we learn about Sturge Weber, we learn about port wine stain. And stain is not a nice word. Nobody likes stains on their clothes. So why would a patient like a stain on their bodies? So uh, fourth wine birthmark is a much more positive, neutral, and accurate word to use. Those are my references. And finally, I want to thank to my amazing uh, mentors in Baskin Palmer, Dr. Peter Chang, uh, mentor on this case, and my um, mentor in my research here at Baskin Palmer, Dr. Bhattacharya. Uh, also, special thanks to Chandler, who made it happen for me, and all the wonderful people in Admiran that I worked during dissertation. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions and try to answer to the best of my ability. Thanks. Oh, the Hebrew word got messed up. All righty, thank you so much. Hey, so for our next presentation, uh, presentation we have Tara Gallant. Uh, she is a fourth year from California Northern University College of Medicine, and she'll be presenting the wholesome foods approach to trabeculectomy training. A fun fact about her is she is a wicked mountain biker from Tahoe and once rode a double black diamond with two flat tires. I don't know if that's true.
All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Tara Gallant. And again, today I'm going to present the wholesome foods approach to trabeculectomy training. Um, so this uh, presentation is going to describe a wet lab approach to helping residents and training physicians practice trabeculectomy surgery. And I thought this would be an exciting presentation to do here because Utah does so much outreach into underserved areas. Um, as well as focuses a lot on uh, making sure their residents are excellent surgeons upon graduation. Um, so first, why do we care about trabeculectomy training? Um, so trabeculectomy surgery, like most surgeries, is less effective in the hands of surgeons in training than when performed by experienced surgeons, um, and it does require a relatively unique skill set. Um, additionally, the number of trabeculectomy surgeries performed in the U.S. is on the decline. Um, in 2005, most residents were only narrowly achieving the surgical numbers required to graduate. Um, and although now there is no specific requirement for trabeculectomy surgeries or surgical training numbers, uh, the number of cases is going down uh, from 6.0 to 4.8 on average for 2009 to 2016, while the number of primary glaucoma drainage procedures is going up, and it's still an important skill set to learn. Um, so the importance of wet labs was really enforced by the COVID-19 pandemic when a lot of uh, elective surgeries, such as ophthalmology procedures, were canceled and postponed, and wet labs became an important way for surgeons in training to keep up their skills. Additionally, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals recently adopted its first resolution to develop eye care in emerging nations, and it was noted that simulation training would be an important part of this. Um, so surgical simulators obviously exist, but they're very expensive, um, and animal eyes um, are another method that people can use to practice surgeries. However, they often take a long time to attain, and they might uh, cause you to come into contact with infectious diseases. In contrast, uh, wet labs are generally very accessible and inexpensive. Um, so for this wet lab, um, all of the materials you need are either available at a local grocery store or they're uh, materials that most surgeons would have on hand. Um, you need a fresh lime, any chicken part with skin, a styrofoam board or head form, uh, forceps, a blade of your choice, surgical scissors, a needle driver, suture material, a marking pin, and a vegetable material or a vegetable peeler. All right. Um, so for preparation, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, you just need to peel the outer green layer of the lime with the vegetable peeler, uh, leaving the white rind in place. Um, and then once that has dried, you can just pin that into a styrofoam holder and use the marking pin to draw a 12 millimeter circle representing the corneal limbus. And the line rind itself will represent the sclera. Um, so then the next step is practicing the creation of a scleral flap. Um, and you wanna create a flap that is about three quarters the depth of the sclera. Um, if the dissection is too deep, you can see a darkening of the color created by the green fruit, uh, much in the way that intraoperatively, you would see a change if you're getting too close to the uvea in a human eye. And then some flap shapes are rectangular, trapezoidal, or triangular, and this is up to the discretion of the surgeon. Um, next, you can practice suturing the flap with 9-0 or 10-0 suture. Um, you can place one suture in each corner of the flap and practice additional sutures if you want. Um, here's a picture of this step of the wet lab. Um, so you can see in figure or images A through D, they are creating a scleral flap. And in images E and F, they're practicing uh, suturing down the corners. Um, the other part of this wet lab is practicing conjunctival sewing on the chicken skin. Um, so again, you can draw a 12 millimeter circle on the chicken skin to represent the corneal limbus. Uh, if you're doing a fornix based trabeculectomy, you're going to create an incision right at the edge of the limbus and sew that shut at either end using interrupted sutures. If you're performing a limbus based trabeculectomy, um, you're going to cut a line in the chicken skin about eight millimeters posterior to the limbus and sew that together using a running suture pattern. Um, so here you can see images of the fornix based incision. So you can see they create an incision and then uh, suture it closed using interrupted sutures. 
And then in these images, you can see the limbus-based incision and the running suture format. Um, so this is a project I developed with some of the ophthalmologists at UC Davis. And after they implemented this wet lab, uh, we sent all of the participants a survey to see how effective this was at helping them uh, perform trabeculectomy surgery. Um, so you can see the responses are the same across the board, whether it was performed by an experienced glaucoma surgeon or a trainee who went on to specialize in a field other than glaucoma. Um, so everyone said that they felt the simulation overall prepared them very well for glaucoma or trabeculectomy surgery, and that the Lyme rind was a good simulation of human sclera and felt helped them feel more confident suturing on human sclera. Uh, similarly, they felt the chicken skin was a good representation of human conjunctiva, and that the simulation prepared them for suturing human conjunctiva. Um, additionally, they said it was very easy to acquire all the procedures and set up this wet lab. Um, so I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Michelle Lim at UC Davis for um, helping me with this wet lab. And if you would like to read more about it, uh, we recently published a paper about this a few months ago. All right, and here are my references. And does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. Careful. I've had personal experience when we used to teach intraosseous line placement you know, to pediatrics residents in developing countries uh, with one of my pediatrics uh, colleagues uh, uh, getting salmonella that required uh, massive IV rehydration. I had to, re you know, reinvent my IV uh, skills um, to get him functional. So urge some caution. Raw chicken uh, can be contaminated. could be another thing like, uh, you know, the other uh, animal specimens as a cause of... Uh, Infectious diseases, salmonella is not good. This is great. This, okay. I think this looks like a really good idea. I did this wet lab good. when I was at UC Davis, and now I'm a glaucoma specialist. So, and, you didn't get salmonella. and I did not get salmonella. <laughs> All right. Well, Thanks, thank you Tara. very much. All right, our next speaker is Gregory Wagner. He's coming to us from Chicago Medical School, and his fun fact is that he lived in the Caribbean for two years. And the title of his talk is Merging PRK and Collagen Cross Linking. Uh, thank you, Lydia, for the introduction. Uh, like she said, my name is Gregory Rognan. I'm a fourth-year medical student visiting from Chicago Medical School at Rosalind Franklin University. Uh, today, I'll be presenting on a recent literature review I was a uh, participant in with Dr. Moshefar about merging PRK and collagen cross-linking. Uh, grateful for the opportunity to do so. Uh, as a brief introduction, keratoconus is the leading cause of idiopathic corneal ectasia. It is characterized by thinning and bulging of the inferior cornea and has a large spectrum of severity ranging from subclinical uh, with no visual symptoms, but with very subtle findings on uh, Scheinflug imaging uh, to very serious uh, stages requiring full thickness corneal transplant. Um, it remains one of the leading independent factors for developing post-operative ectasia, and, to, and in any stage of the disease, it can be a risk factor. As such, uh, detecting these um, very subtle patients in form proof keratoconus uh, is of great interest and has been the focus of a lot of research recently. Uh, most of these studies focus on comparing a normal fellow eye of apparent unilateral keratoconic patients to the eyes of controlled post-operative healthy eyes. Um, just some recent examples. In 2013, Dr. Smadja and company developed a decision tree-based system to screen for FFKC. Um, the sensitivity and specificity were pretty promising. Uh, in 2018, Dr. Wing also uh, and company uh, introduced a system using 13 different parameters of OCT epithelium mapping and Pentacam, uh, reporting perfect sensitivity and specificity. Uh, the main takeaway is that the 
detection of foreign fruits keratoconus is very difficult. It's very subtle, and there's no one parameter that would be useful in detecting this disease. Um, however, in clinical practice, this, these systems, unfortunately, are a little bit lackluster. They have great uh, utility in the reported populations. Um, but for example, Dr. Smadja's system seemed to uh, err on the side of false negatives and Dr. Wing's on the side of false positives. Uh, so this leads into a potential application of this combined form of PRK and cross-linking to reduce further the, the post-operative risk of ectasia, though the incidence of this ectasia extremely low already between two one-hundredths and, and six-tenths of a percent. Um, however, this can also be applied to keratoconic patients undergoing cross-linking generally. The initial venture into a combined, <clears throat> excuse me, PRK and cross-linking procedure was first began in 2009 by Dr. Kananopoulos, um, named the Athens Protocol. Uh, previously in 2007, he suggested that a, a PRK procedure should be delayed 12 months after cross-linking, but in this 2009 paper, he found that to be inferior. Um, and since that, many other uh, papers have been published about different protocols and combining different forms of PRK and cross-linking. Um, in 2020, Dr. Kankaria and Kim Yonis uh, said in a review article that despite the promising results of this case report referring to the delayed procedure, um, there were several limitations with this two-step approach. The ablation rate might be different in a cross-linked than in a non-operated virgin cornea, leading to unpredictable refractive results and possible limited effectiveness of PRK. The risk of post-PRK haze formation is higher as the anterior stroma is repopulated by new keratocytes six months after cross-linking. Lastly, and probably the most significant limitation of this approach is that the second step PRK removes part of the cross-linked corneal tissue, thereby potentially decreasing the stiffening effect of cross-linking. Uh, this delayed versus simultaneous uh, procedure is certainly under debate currently, and there, the jury is still out as to whether the simultaneous approach is superior. However, there is promising results so far. Uh, these are taken from the submitted article, um, the manuscript. Uh, the, the figure on the left shows a general overview of the most popular protocols, the Athens protocols, uh, the Cretan Plus, and Tel Aviv. Uh, the original Cretan was excluded in the review because it did not use PRK with cross-linking, just PTK. As you can see, some of the differences range from the type of PRK, the use of PTK, the order of both, the use of mitomycin C, the riboflavin soak procedure or the corneal cross-linking uh, UVA radiation protocol. Um, for example, in the enhanced Athens protocol, they use a customized profile for cross-linking uh, as demonstrated in the figure on the right. They focus a larger amount of irradiance over the thinnest and steepest portion of the cornea, giving promising results in disease stabilization, but also refractive benefit. Uh, these are um, some graphs and figures from the paper uh, the top left is showing the improvements in visual acuity across the papers studied. Um, it is reported in LogMAR, and the standard deviation because of the logarithmic scale is quite large. However, there was significance uh, because of, of the large amount of eyes uh, analyzed. Uh, respectively, in UDVA, it was an average improvement from 2250 to 2050 was found, and in spectacle corrected vision, 2040 to 2025. Um, we also did a random effects analysis to see if the combined effect was reasonable. Uh, the combined effect size is represented by the diamond on the very bottom with a 95% interval co confidence interval, showing that um, though the heterogeneity is large across the papers, there is a combined effect uh, size that the treatment would be beneficial for the patient. Uh, Keratometric parameters also showed promising results, namely in K1, K2, mean K, and K max. Uh, the forest plots for those are also shown here, all showing combined effects that are consistent with improvement uh, postoperatively. Manifest refraction was also analyzed, uh, showing uh, really promising improvements in spherical equivalent, especially, um, but also in sphere and cylinder. And all uh, the papers that we analyzed in these parameters were also, also showed a combined effect of a positive improvement postoperatively. Uh, so the question remains certainly of which of these approaches is best. At this point, we cannot say because of a large amount of variables between the papers and different protocols. Um, however, we can say with moderate certainty that a combined approach would likely be of net benefit for the patient, both from a safety profile, convenience, and a refractive benefit, and disease stabilization postoperatively. 
um, to assess more carefully if a combined versus delayed approach would be best. Uh, standardized control trials would need to be done first to assess the simultaneous versus delayed. And if there is a benefit in a controlled setting that the simultaneous procedure is better than comparing the different protocols between each other. Um, it could be said at this point that a, a combined procedure that combines the mo the latest technology in PRK and cross-linking would be best. Uh, for example, the Athens Enhance uses uh, topography guided CTA adjusted and a high speed eye tracking PRK with a com with a customized PRK profile uh, with really good results uh, postoperatively. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right, if there are no other questions, then we move on to Wyatt Corbin, who's uh, visiting us from Loyola Me uh, School of Medicine. And his fun fact is that he has an identical twin. And he's gonna speak to us about the effect and implications of diabetes on fully dilated pupil size before and after cataract surgery. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Um, <clears throat> really grateful to be here. Um, another fun fact is that I am experiencing like migraine aura right now. So forgive me if I'm a little, you know, need to find my place. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to present this research I've been working on uh, with Dr. Felipe de Alba, retina specialist at Loyola. Um, we uh, received a grant from the Illinois Society for the Prevention of Blindness for this project, which I wanted to point out. Um, and uh, it's been a great opportunity to work on it with, with him and with that team. That, and uh, So just some background. Um, there's, as many of us know, there's an increasing global prevalence of diabetic retinopathy and vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy. Um, in 2020, um, there was about 100 million people with diabetic retinopathy and about almost 30 million people with vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy. And by 2045, that's expected to increase by about 50%, if not more, for both categories. Um, as we're aware, these, must, these conditions must be addressed by annual dilated fundus exams, um, injections, and relevant to our study, PRP, lasers, and pars plantar vitrectomy. So background tying this into cataract surgery. Um, at baseline, in all patients, cataract surgery leads to uh, decreased fully dilated pupil sizes postoperatively. Diabetes compounds this through a variety of mechanisms. One, people with diabetes have smaller pupils at baseline compared correlated with smaller pupils postoperatively. As Hayashi and Hayashi here shows, um, the smaller the preoperative pupil area, the smaller the postoperative pupil area. Um, compound this with the fact that people with diabetes have a greater risk of cataract formation and they experience greater reductions in size um, due to cataract surgery than people without diabetes, um, then we can get a, a more significant problem. Um, some proposed mechanisms for this include neuropathy of the ocular sympathetic innervation, degenerative changes of the iris muscle, higher concentrations of substance P and calcitonin G-related peptide due to surgical trauma, as well as inflammation might play a minor role, um, but it still does play a role. So why is this clinically relevant? How is it clinically relevant? For cataract surgeons, um, there is some increased risk of intraoperative complications with smaller pupil sizes. You have increased surgically induced meiosis, um, as well as just a smaller window for operating, necess necessitating the use of malugan rings and other medication, medicational um, interventions, which come with their own risks and benefits. This also has an increased risk for post-operative complications, such as um, limited view when you're performing pars plantar vitrectomy in these diabetic patients with retinopathy, or limited view when performing panretinal photocoagulation laser therapy, as well as um, 
perhaps you're not going to be able to get as dilated of a, of a fundus exam when um, you have smaller pupil sizes. So building off the previous research, again, based off of the slide I touched on a few um, slides ago that people with diabetes have smaller pupil sizes preoperatively, it hasn't yet been shown if what the effect is between or what the difference is or if there is a difference between non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy patients and proliferative diabetic retinopathy patients. We hypothesize that there will be a greater reduction between these two groups, namely in the proliferative diabetic retinopathy group. Uh, we also hypothesize that the reductions will remain beyond three months postoperatively. That has not yet been shown. The largest study has uh, was done in, or the longest study postoperatively was taken by Totsuka et al. in 2012. Um, but we um, we're going to take it out further, six months and possibly a year to see what the pupil sizes are postoperatively in these patients. And finally, for this last one, I'll just explain the pluses mean that there's a greater reduction, the minus there's a smaller reduction. These reductions vary based on the duration um, since diabetes diagnosis. So there'd be greater reductions over time. Uh, the A1C, if there's greater A1C, you have greater reduction. Uh, if they're on insulin treatment, then I'll be greater reduction than patients on oral medications, non-insulin medications for diabetes. And, then, and that will be greater than patients only managing their diabetes through lifestyle management. And finally, if they have a presence of prior PRP treatment, we hypothesize not as great reductions. Um, and that's because of the damage, potential damage to the short ciliary nerves performed during PRP treatment, which can cause increased um, meiosis um, when uh, you try to dilate the fundus, try, try to dilate the, the iris. So for our study protocol, we are getting 20 patients into four patient groups. So 80 patients total. One will have a control group, patients without diabetes. Two, diabetes, patients with diabetes without retinopathy. Three, patients with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And four, patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So again, 20 in each group, 80 total. And each of these patients are scheduled for cataract surgery. And then we measure their pupil sizes before and after cataract surgery, ideally at one month, three months, and six months postoperatively using the right and Retinomax K plus three device. Um, and of course, patients who must not meet any exclusion criteria. So currently, where are we at in our project? Uh, we've had uh, we've been at this project for about a year, and data collection can can be difficult. Um, but we have collected a decent amount of preoperative measurements. We mainly have patients in the preoperative, in the control group and diabetic group without retinopathy. Although we do have measurements for the non-proliferative and proliferative diabetic retinopathy groups. Um, because we are still collecting data, we still need to perform our final statistical analysis. We haven't determined significance yet, but we do have results, preliminary results that we find are interesting that uh, I would like to present because it can help us to project what, what our final results may be based on previous research. So these uh, preliminary results we have, it is encouraging um, in terms of uh, our hypotheses that we do see a decrease in pupil size between patients with diabetes without retinopathy and then to non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and the proliferative retinopathy. It starts at 5.8, as you see, to about five and then to about 3.3. .3. Of course, we need greater sample sizes to, um, to determine significance, but this is interesting. Um, finally, patients with diabetic treatment, patients with no, on no treatment with diabetes have an average size of 6.45 millimeters, patients on oral medications only, 5.3 millimeters, and then patients on insulin only, five. Um, some, uh, some data we have um, based on the A1C value. We have a slight negative correlation uh, for increased A1C value um, and pre average preoperative pupil size. Um, but the correlation is actually stronger um, and negative for the duration of diabetes since prior surgery. Um, they're both not in incredibly strong, but it, it is um, perhaps, perhaps significant and it is encouraging to know. So based on these data, um, we can make certain um, Kind of hypotheses guesses what we think will be the outcome. We do expect to find greater reductions, but we need to finish our patient recruitment, data collection, and data analysis. Um, but 
it'll be similar to the analyses I just showed you, but more based on the reductions between preoperative and postoperative pupil size. Finally, after we do that, we'll identify some trends, draw some conclusions, and then highlight some future research directions. A few studies that you could do are the effect of small pupils on diabetic retinopathy screening, diagnosis, disease monitoring, the effectiveness or extent of limitation of small pupils on PRP, PPV, and other interventional retinal treatments, and ultimately the prognosis of diabetic retinopathy. Interestingly, um, Dr. De Alba observed that administering cyclopensilate three times per day in his patients one month postoperatively did um, restore. Uh, uh, he, he believed anecdotally some pupil size, but we need to have some official data um, to back that up and encourage some other clinical trials of this issue. These are my references. So thank you for your time. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, thank you. All right, and then the last speaker of the day is Brianna Banaszewski, who's coming from Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And her fun fact is that she qualified for the Nigerian Olympic team in gymnastics. And the title of her talk today is Technology Guided Central Retinal Artery Occlusion Intervention Reverses Vision Loss, a 24 month pilot study. Thank you for that introduction, Lydia. Let me just pull up my slides. Okay. Okay. Good morning. My name is Brianna Banaszewski, and I'm a fourth year medical student at the Icon School of Medicine in New York City. Thank you for the podium time today. I'm excited to speak with you all about a project that I've been involved with in Mount Sinai, where we have used technology to reduce time to treatment for our CRAO patients. First, I'd like to acknowledge my mentor and the lead of this project, Dr. Gareth Lima, a retina specialist at Sinai, as well as all the other physicians listed on the screen who've made this project possible. Also, I'd like to mention that we will be discussing off-label use of TPA throughout the presentation. So by way of background, CRAO has recently been identified in the literature as a treatable medical emergency. This is akin to stroke. However, unlike stroke, there aren't widespread systems in place to accelerate the diagnosis and accelerate treatment for our CRAO patients. Here's a couple examples identifying this challenge in the literature. In 2021, the American Heart Association released a scientific statement calling on hospitals to prioritize early recognition and triage of the CRAO patients. In addition, later in 21, excuse me, 2021, a group of physicians at Emory did a retrospective review over a decade of their CRAO patients, and they found that only three out of 181 patients were eligible for treatment. And this was because a long time from last known well to presentation, as well as a long time between presentation to diagnosis. So again, we see on the publication in 2021 calling on hospitals and health systems to accelerate uh, diagnostic pathways for CRAO. So the problem has been well established in the literature. It's simply taking too much time to diagnose CRAO. Therefore, fewer patients are eligible for treatment. This problem was also identified at Mount Sinai. Actually, in late 2020, we had our stroke team approach the Department of Ophthalmology, and they asked us if we'd like to collaborate with them on a updated clinical protocol that would help reduce the time to diagnosis so more patients could be eligible for treatment. So an interdisciplinary team came together, and this team had two goals. The, one, the first goal is to reduce time to treatment for CRIO patients. The second goal is to integrate into existing stroke team pathways as much as possible. And this second goal is all about uptake. We wanted this new process to be seamlessly integrated into the stroke team pathway. So if you're trying to identify pain points in a process, the first step is to understand what you're dealing with. So here is the protocol prior to the update. On the top left-hand side of your screen, the patient presents at an ED at one of Mount Sinai's several emergency departments across New York. A stroke code is activated. 
the stroke team conducts their exam and they get CT or CTA imaging. Then the ophthalmology team is consulted. And depending on what emergency department they're in, ophthalmology might not be in-house. So oftentimes you're waiting for ophthalmology to travel to that hospital. Then the ophthalmology team conducts a non-dilated exam. We wait for dilation. Then we conduct the dilated exam. And only then can we share with the stroke team whether it's a confirmed CRAO and the stroke team makes the ultimate decision on if this patient is eligible for TPA. The team, the, this interdisciplinary team put their heads together and said, where is this process taking the most amount of time? And the areas that were taking the most amount of time are highlighted on the screen. And, at, and um, the, all of these boxes that are highlighted are related to the in-person ophthalmology consults. It was simply taking too much time for the ophthalmology a team to arrive in person and conduct their exam. So the solution that we developed was to completely eliminate the in-person portion of CRAO diagnosis and instead replace it with remote consultation with a group of retina specialists because we have now implemented OCT imaging devices within emergency departments across Mount Sinai. So here's what that updated protocol looks like. We start out the same. The patient pre presents with symptoms that are suspicious of CRAO. Stroke code is activated. And then we start to differ. The stroke team immediately after activation of the code contacts that group of retina specialists who have joined the CRAO remote diagnosis team. And they give that group a heads up that data will be coming soon on a potential CRAO. Then the stroke team conducts its regular exam as before. And in addition, they use the local OCT machine that's in that emergency department to get an OCT image. And that image, along with all the history and other exam components, are sent in real time digitally to that group of retina specialists. That group of retina specialists within five minutes confirms receipt of the data, and they can quickly analyze the history, the exam data, and the OCT imaging, and let the stroke team know if it's a CRAO or not. Importantly, I do want to call out that there are certain criteria. If a patient meets, they automatically switch over to an inpatient consult. Those criteria are listed on the screen, and the stroke team is thoroughly trained on these criteria. So the novel part of this pathway is elimination of the in-person consult and replacing that with OCT imaging devices within the emergency departments. When we were choosing which OCT device to use, we wanted one that was easily usable. That was the primary factor of choosing a machine because the stroke team was getting trained on how to use this. And the last thing we wanted was to have technology complicate the integration of this new protocol. So the one that we selected is pretty much point and shoot, and it automatically focuses. In addition, we liked this device because the screen is embedded in the machine itself. Several OCT machines require a monitor, and that just takes up too much room. And emergency departments, at least in New York City, simply don't have the room to store many devices. In the middle of the screen, you see a couple examples of images that have been sent to the retina, retina team throughout this protocol. The top image, I am by no means a retina expert, but the top image does represent a patient with CRAO. And we can see that because we have foveal glow right here in the middle. We have lack of differentiation between the retina fiber layers, and we have hyper reflectivity of the internal retina layers. So if the um, once the retina team receives the OCT imaging and the other exam components, they can let the stroke team know digitally whether it's a CRAO. So this new clinical protocol has been live since May, 2021. And in the first 24 months, 86 patients were evaluated, 33 had confirmed CREOs and 15 were eligible for treatment. We did see a reduced time to treatment overall. Prior to this protocol update, we were at about four hours from when that patient came into the ED to when they were being treated. Now we're down to 2.5. In addition, we've seen vision recovery. So visual acuity increased on average from counting fingers to 2,100, and 60% of our patients who receive TPA improved vision from worse than 2,200 to better than 2,100. And this metric has been used in the literature to define uh, vision recovery. 
Importantly, we have had no intracranial bleeds or systemic complications. And for folks who are familiar with TPA use for CRAO in the literature, these results are very similar to the Hopkins trial that was conducted in 2008. So the key takeaways here are that uh, improving CRAO diagnosis times can increase eligibility for potential vision saving treatment. This type of solution does require interdisciplinary collaboration and cross department stakeholder buy-in. But from our experience, we do believe that the time consuming inpatient uh, ophthalmology consults can be replaced by using OCT imaging devices um, and a remote retina group um, that can remotely review and diagnose CRAO. Thank you for your time and I'm open for questions. Hi, uh, thank you to all the students uh, for the presentations. They've been excellent. And I have lots of questions for all of you later. Um, <laughs> but do you know what the positive predictive value of OCT is in this setting, um, considering the, the treatment has significant risks? Mm -hmm. so, so it's a good question. I don't have that number off the top of my head, um, but we, we did recently publish a paper. It's under review right now. And I believe that number is in there. So I can get back to you with that. Thank you. I guess it's a similar question. Why did you, uh, or I guess you didn't make the decision, but why did they opt for OCT versus non-midriatic camera? Yes, yeah, so this was a case um, in which we we were approached with the idea um, of OCT and we had a relationship with an OCT um, company that, was, that we had a grant to get these three machines. And so it was trying to um, evaluate if those OCT machines were as effective as other diagnostic tools. And we did a review before this pilot was implemented. We ran a review, this was before my time at the school, and we ran a study to see if those OCT machines were as um, as effective in diagnosis. And we found that OCT imaging was, and therefore we went forward with the OCT line. We had a M and M uh, very recently on a very acute CRAO uh, where the patient got TPA and had a tremendous recovery of his vision. So we've also had an opportunity to review the literature recently, and um, uh, we've long had a protocol, um, but it has the same issues that you described. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately for us, we're mainly dealing with one emergency room, but what that means is that all the other emergency rooms uh, are are not. Right, right, and, and to that point, um, we're excited about this remote ability because CRAOs aren't that common. And when you go to rural community clinics, I don't see it very often. And they have to travel multiple hours, patients have to travel multiple hours to cities to get treatment. This is a way where you could in the future see a remote diagnostic capability um, where all you need is a machine. You don't necessarily need on-call ophthalmologists to make that call. So we, we are excited about um, the potential for rural support here. I would just make one other comment, which mm -hmm. is that um, that's a lot of CRAOs in in two years. Mm -hmm. um, we I don't know our our number. We probably average three or four a year at 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 the most. It's not. It's just, you think so? Or that actually would come in within the window, so meet yeah. the protocol. Yeah, right. It, it's pretty rare. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so this intervention only helps from presentation to treatment, and that's a big limitation, right? Because the the treatment eligibility is last known well to presentation. So we think pairing this with the public health education campaign to have patients understand what symptoms to look out for to present earlier, that would help us really dramatically improve eligibility for patients. And there was just a question on the chat if fundus photography would work as well. Yeah, so we um, would like to incorporate that actually uh, at Arvo. I was with my mentor, Dr. Lima, and we went around testing out all the um, new technologies for fundus photos. That's where we want to take this. We all know that new fundus photo technology is rather expensive, um, but that's absolutely the future. We want to um, use, we want to get as much data as possible within the emergency department. So short answer is yes.
Thank you.